Yeah, we're ready. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Susan O'Brien, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for umpteen years. Mm -hmm. uh, she worked as a nurse with my wife for many years, and she's branched out and uh, uh, now is involved with, with hospice. And so I'm not going to say a whole lot more because I forgot what she told me to say. <laughs> but that reason, you know, at this age. But anyway, uh, she's a great gal, and uh, she's going to make a presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Fred. Thank you, everyone. So as Fred said, I am a nurse, and I've had wonderful thing about nursing is that you can do so many different things. I mean, all with the intention of helping people. That's why you go into the field. Um, so my journey has brought me to be a hospice nurse at this time. And I'll talk a little bit about how I became a hospice nurse. But the first thing I want to say is, I have a question for you. How many of you have had a conversation about your own death or the end of your life with your family. Excellent, that's great. It's not a very common topic of conversation, but it really should be. So during my time as a nurse, it has become really apparent to me that as a society in general, we don't talk about death or dying. It's, in, it's like something quiet in the closet. And then also, there's very little accurate information that I found out that people know about their options and what hospice care is. So that's what led me to where I presently stand before you as a hospice nurse. It's inevitable that all of us are one day going to face the end of our lives. We know that, that's part of our, our journey, that's part of the deal. The difference is how you experience it. And hospice can help. So what I want you to know is that you do have options and I'm gonna explain what they are and how to ensure them. What is hospice? The hospice is a model, and I love that word. It's a model of care holistically. What does that mean? It means that it deals with the whole person, holistic whole. I'm a nurse, and if you have pain, if you were sick from cancer and had pain, I could give you a medicine, a narcotic, to take care of that pain. But what about the pain that's here and that's here? You know that you're sick, and sometimes, especially on hospice, it's the, at the end of your life. We know that there's not a cure. I want to treat your whole person. And I do that with an interdisciplinary team. Hospice has a team that kind of swoops in. You know, you come on hospice, and unfortunately, um, it was polled, and seven out of ten people said they were referred to hospice too late. And that's something, again, that we're going to talk about. That's why this is an education piece to get it out there. Um, hospice is from a prognosis of six months or less of your life, but people tend to come on for two months, sometimes a few days. So this team, you get admitted, this team comes in, and who are these people? Well, there's a nurse, and I'm going to come in, and I'm going to medically look at you and, and take care of your symptoms in your body. But there's a social worker. There's spiritual care. There's music therapy. There's pet therapy. So all these people come in, and there's also home health aides. When you're caring for somebody at the end of life, there's a lot of physicality. Stress, yes, and also the physicality of it. We want to come in. We want people to be in their home because most people do want to be in their homes. We want to take the stress out of this experience and let you be present with your loved one at home. Now, the hospice organization did a poll in 1996 nationally. 88% of the people polled said that if they had a terminal illness, they want to be cared for at home. I'm part of that, by the way. Yet statistically, half of people are still dying in the hospital. So now, in 2003, I graduated from Duchess Community College, and I went into nursing right away. I went to Northern Duchess, which was fantastic. I found my way to the OR, which was great. And then I went to hospice. I always had a very comfortable feeling with end of life, so I knew that that's probably where I needed to be. I went to hospice, but then I decided to be a better practitioner in hospice. I needed to find out what people go through before they get to hospice. What are we doing as a medical profession? How are we doing it as a society for people who are diagnosed with terminal illness or severe illness? So I went to work in acute oncology. And I have to tell you, at that time, I was absolutely blown away by the lack of information and options that people were given and how little people knew about hospice care. I would have people in their beds, wonderful, amazing individuals at the end of their life, take me by my hand and say, I wanna go home. 
I don't want to be here. I had a woman named Margaret a couple of weeks into my first rotation on the unit. This woman was 76 years old. She was having chemotherapy to help her cancer. Sweetest woman. She had a, now unfortunately chemotherapy has a list a mile long of side effects and that's part of the deal. It kills the good, but it kills the bad, hopefully. So she was having some GI trouble and she had to keep going to the bathroom and she rang the bell to me and she was profusely apologizing to me. She was embarrassed and she said, I'm sorry, I gotta go to the bathroom again. I don't know why this is happening to me. And I said to her, didn't your doctor tell you that this was a side effect? And she said, no, I would have never wanted this. And right then and there I said, wait a minute, hold on. It is absolutely fine if you want treatment. If you want everything, that's not the point that I'm making. The point is I found that people weren't getting the information. A big problem was that if we don't talk about it as a society, and I'm going to just say this in general, if I come to you and I say, as a doctor or practitioner that, you know, looking at all the tests, that it looks like this is, you know, where we're at. We haven't talked about it ahead of time. Guess what? Shock mode comes in. When shock mode comes in, you don't hear. You can't make rational decisions. And it makes it very complicated at the end. So that's where my work began. So I said to myself, okay, where are our problems? Our problems are number one. Our medical profession at this point, unfortunately, is trained to sustain life to the very end. There's only four medical schools that have any end of life training. I'm not talking about training towards the end of life. I'm saying you're at the end of life. How do I care for you at the end of life? It's different than I can keep somebody alive very easily with transfusions, with oxygen, with whatever means, but keeping somebody alive and living are two entirely different things. Thank you. So what I wanna say is now, why are we doing that? And, and you know, what is the point? And if, if I found that most people were okay and that's what they wanted, but the fact that they weren't okay, and, and also the families, I know that we love our loved ones. So to see the suffering be a hundred times harder for the family and for the patient, it was not acceptable. So I said, okay, where does our, where does our work go? What we have to do is we have to open up the discussion. It has to be okay. We're scared of the talk, yet it's something so natural that we're going to experience. We have to, I always say, you know, you talk to your kids, you have that sex talk at a certain point. Do you want to do it? Not really, but you know, is it necessary? Absolutely. This is the same thing. We have to sit down with our loved ones, with our parents, I happen to do it with my child already because he knows where I work. It's an uncomfortable topic, but guess what? You start talking about something that's been in the closet and all of a sudden that fear component, oh, wait a minute, you know what? That's not so scary. And it's empowering because you're gonna decide what you want. You know, my mom, God bless her heart, she wants the whole nine yards and that's perfectly fine. My dad, he doesn't want anything and that's fine too. Do I agree with, you know, it's about what they want. The most loving thing you can do for your loved ones, number one, is not put the burden on them to decide. They won't agree, by the way. I've had so many people fighting outside a patient's room, and the patient hears it. It's not okay to put that, you know, and they're trying their best. One says, yes, they want to have the surgery for mom. One says, let her go in peace. This is the last opportunity you're going to have with a loved one. You don't want it to be full of strife. Everyone knows the case of Terry Schiavo. She was in a coma for seven years because there was no healthcare proxy, the family was fighting. That's not how we want end of life to be. So, like I said, if my mom wants everything, if my dad wants nothing, I'm going to, it's a no brainer, it's on paper. So all I'm gonna do is support their wishes. So what I'm saying to you is to do an advanced directive. An advanced directive is a legal document. It consists of two forms. One is a living will, which states what you want or what you don't want for end of life care. It's very simple. The other is a healthcare proxy, and that's going to be the person you assign to speak for you if you can't speak for yourself. Okay. You can get those forms. You want to do it by state. So New York State, the Department of Health, click on forms, go to advanced directives. You can easily um, download it. Or I like the um, WWWAARP website. It gives you a little more explanation to what the forms are, how to fill them out. But again, do it by state. Very, very important. I have a story about two terrific men that I knew, 80 years old, both diagnosed with lung cancer within a month of each other. Robert was a very educated man in Boston, and he decided to go into aggressive treatment right away. His doctors had all the latest medical treatment knowledge um, 
very sophisticated, everything at his, at his disposal. Lee said, okay, I'm 80 years old, I've had a good life, and if this is what it is, then this is what it is. So he decided to go home on hospice care. Robert was in and out of the hospital, and he, in a few months, the, they did the PET scan, and they said to him, you know what, the present chemo isn't working. They started him on another one, and again, he was in and out of the hospital many, many times, very weak, and he missed out on a lot of family functions. Robert died in December of 2011, a little over a year from his diagnosis. Now, Lee, although very advanced in his care and his process, was with us till February. However, Lee was home the whole time. He was making jokes. He was getting in and out of bed in his garden. I want to make this very clear. I'm not saying that aggressive treatment is not the option, but I want you to know that you do have options because I'm finding that it's not really clear. Choose whatever is right for you. This is about you and your family. There are certain parts in your life that you will remember. <clears throat> End of life is something that's videotaped in our minds. That's how you're going to remember the last days of somebody that you care about and that you've been with your whole life. It is so crucially important that you make sure those days are how you want them to be. And they can be positive. You know, death is a natural experience. Just like a baby coming into the world, we make special preparation and prepare for that. We need to do the same for people leaving us. Lots of love and support. So I do urge you to do your healthcare proxies, okay? It's very important, have this conversation with your family, open it up. This is about you and your loved ones. You have options and you can decide what's right for you. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Question, observation. Sure. Absolutely. My family and I just went through a horrendous situation with my wife's cousin where he lingered uh, for three months after what should have been a routine operation, not here in Northern Duchess, by the way, but down on Long Island. Mm -hmm. And all I could think of watching him lay there <coughs> unconscious with the tubes and then with the beepers and everything, we wouldn't let our dogs suffer like this. We don't. And so the question is, yeah. Do you see it as a medical professional someday where we have a, a legalized situation where we're allowed to stop someone suffering? You know, I do. That's just, I mean, that's such a wonderful observation and, and yeah. story. My son, when he was about eight years old, said to me, because his grandmother on the other side had passed away and she suffered. He says to me, how come we can put our dogs to sleep, but we can't put people right. we love? That's incredible from an eight-year-old. So yes, there are a few states now that do have it. Massachusetts in November, is it, the law is coming up for dying with dignity. And, you know, they've done, and I'm going to do this in another talk because it's really important. The states that have it already have done tests on who comes to ask for it and who needs it. And it's not what people were saying was going to be the problem with it. People who are middle class, <laughs> white, educated people get the medications. And I think it's a sense of control. I don't want to suffer. I have the medication if I need it. And I think it's statistically only half of them actually use it if that. So it's, there's a lot of good... Um, record material coming out to support that we should do that. And again, there's two doctors that need to sign off. It's not just one doctor is going to make that decision that, oh, yes, you're end of life. You know, you're going to have two doctors that are respected, and their license is going to be on, the, and integrity is going to be on the line. So it's going to be somebody who is at a terminal, end of life, and that if there's going to be suffering, major suffering involved, they can choose to go a little earlier. And I think we sh absolutely should have that. I'm not sure why we don't at this point. Yeah, I mean, yes. just a comment on, you know, to follow up with Joan is saying, I mean, the reality is, and I don't want to sound like an insensitive jerk, but, but part of the expense of health care yeah. has to do with people who just have no possibility of, say, waking up and just lingering for three months in a hospital and then the government or insurance you, company sees a seven figure you can't you know, ignore bill. the financial motivation that's happening the wall street it. journal recently did a story yeah. called the crushing cost of care 76 percent was with the elderly you know in their last Absolutely. very small yeah. fraction yeah. I am not a money person, I'm a people person. And when I see the people suffering, like people on, on drips and ventilators and in hospitals and being, I'm sure everyone has had a surgery of some sort or whatnot to recover from that. If you do that to an elderly person or if you put 
chemotherapy into them, it's almost an impossible course to endure at a certain point. So ethically and morally, we have an obligation to be honest about end of life. You know, and so that has to be addressed and we have to find out, you know, and we have to just start saying to people, we got to do the right thing. But if we're not going to have the medical doctors address it, if we address it by doing our advanced directives, it's a no brainer. Here, doctor, you know, oh, you know, these are your options. Oh, I already have what I, I don't really want anything. If it's, you know, terminal end of life, I'd like to be kept comfortable and go home. So okay. in this case, there were no advanced directives. So Not that I'm aware of. The, the, so this person is laying there, was young, from was my perspective, yeah. in agony. Young, healthy, yeah. And it was unexpected. And every time they touch right. it, they made And the medical profession yeah. or our culture doesn't have a process. They're not going to do it. The process is, if you don't have that paper, right. you're going on it. You're going to get caught in a treadmill of Medicare until you pass away. And that's not the place to be for you or your family, period. So do those forms, and they can be changed at any time. If you decide what you want today, guess what? If you want to change that at any time, you can, so it's not set in stone. But do them to have. It just is a, a feeling of, of security because it's your choice. Yeah. And make sure you file them. You have to file them with the clerk's office. You want to have, okay, and you want to have several copies. And you want to have a copy where you know where it is. Let's say, for instance, I had to go into the hospital. I want to be able to say it's right in that top dresser drawer. You can have your practitioner have one, make several copies. And of course, have your health care proxy have one. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Thank Good you. questions. Thanks. Is that everything? David, are you pacing for a reason? I didn't know if there was a gift today. So. Oh, I got it right here. Oh. <laughs> this is a gift for you. Thank you so much. Oh, I love it. Perfect. A pen, a pen so you can make those notes. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. I love it. This is great. Is that it for the day? Did you notice that we're four minutes early? Will you get a goal?